just all right so uh, hello everyone uh, i'm very happy to have so many people here attending the meeting today with a talk given by uh, lambert sudarod we are very happy that you could join us here today. Uh, Professor Zuderwart is uh, Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the Institute for Christian Studies at uh, Toronto and currently visiting scholar at Calvin University. And he has an upcoming book uh, called Social Domains of Truth, Science, Politics, Art and Religion, which is also probably related to today's, to to today's topic and uh, lecture. But there are also other uh, books worth mentioning. One of the more recent ones is Truth and Husserl Heidegger and the Frankfurt School, Critical Retrieval, published with the MIT Press in 2017. And another book that bears the word truth in the title is Religion, Truth and Social Transformation with McGill. Uh, University Press published in 2016. That's not all there are. Uh, multiple other books that are worth mentioning, but I will uh, stop here and uh, uh, invite Professor Zuderwart uh, to start with his lecture. Thank you very much and uh, please go ahead. Thanks Ansgar and thank you to the uh, organizers of this series. I think it's a very important series and I'm very honored to be part of it. Uh, the topic for today is truth post-truth Reimagining Philosophy for a World in Crisis. Truth is in trouble. Prominent contemporary philosophers have questioned whether the idea of truth is important. Does it deserve the emphasis scholars have given it in the past? Should it play a central role in intellectual endeavors today? Do we even need it? Their questions both reflect and reinforce broader trends in Western society, where many people wonder whether they can or should pursue truth. When you claim to know the truth, someone is sure to dismiss it as just your opinion. And when you challenge a truth claim, someone will quickly trot out a defensive, that's my truth, as if truth and opinion are the same. Not surprisingly, many people think truthiness the mere appearance of truth is all we can hope for, and truthiness, not truth, is all we need to achieve. Indeed, some pundits say we have become a post-truth society, one where feelings trump facts in public affairs. Why have so many people become skeptical about the idea of truth? There are many reasons, but I'd like to single out two. First, the standard concept of truth is too narrow. Second, both philosophy and the general culture have privileged scientific truth over other sorts of truth. As a result, we do not have a comprehensive way to think about truth that can embrace scientific truth without dismissing other sorts of truth. And we have lost track of the importance of truth. Today, I'll briefly introduce the standard concept of truth and three philosophical objections to it. Next, I'll propose an alternative way to think about what I call propositional truth. Then I'll show there is more to truth than such propositional truth. I'll conclude by exploring what my alternative conception of truth implies for the tasks of philosophy today. Section one, truth as correspondence, question mark. The standard concept of truth in modern Western culture is that truth consists of an alignment between beliefs or statements on the one hand and objects or facts on the other. Hence, for example, when I say the cat is on the mat, then according to the standard concept, what I have said is true if and only if the cat is indeed on the mat. If the cat is not in fact on the mat, the statement is false. Truth in this instance pertains to how the content of my statement aligns with the fact that makes it true. The content of my statement is what philosophers call a proposition. The prevailing philosophical account of this alignment is called a correspondence theory of truth. 
According to this theory, truth consists of a correspondence between propositions and fact. There are many different versions of correspondence theory and various philosophers have challenged or rejected it altogether. Nevertheless, compared with other philosophical accounts, the correspondence theory of truth most closely reflects the standard concept of truth. Precisely this standard concept and the correspondence theory are in trouble now. Three philosophical positions cause the most trouble. The first is deflationism. The deflationist holds that when we say a statement is true, we do not employ a genuine predicate. Either the phrase is true does not apply to anything or it does not express a real property. So our claiming that a sentence or assertion or proposition is true does no significant work. In the words of Willard Quine, to ascribe truth to the sentence, snow is white, is to ascribe whiteness to snow. Ascription of truth just cancels the quotation marks. Hence, we do not need to say that such a sentence is true. We could just utter the sentence. A second truth troubling position is radical contextualism. Radical contextualism holds that the validity of truth claims is relative to the social and cultural contexts in which claims get made. Hence, there is no objective truth, nor is objective truth the goal of inquiry. Richard Rorty is the most forceful recent proponent of radical contextualism. Rorty argues that when we say a claim is true, we are simply saying it is justified. And when we say a claim is justified, we are saying it is justified for the audience to which the claim is addressed. A true claim then would simply be one that is justified or justifiable in a certain context. And what is true in one context need not be true in another. The third truth troubling position has to do with the political roles fulfilled by claims to truth. This position, this position has many versions, and we can find them throughout contemporary critical theory broadly construed. The most prominent version occurs in the literature surrounding the French post-structuralist Michel Foucault. It portrays truth as no more than an ideological tool within struggles for power. So truth claims are simply power moves. And the question whether a truth claim is valid becomes the question whether it is, it is effective in a struggle for power. I call this position the political instrumentalizing of truth or politicization for short. It has the effect of undermining the significance of truth. Together, deflationism, radical contextualism, and politicization dramatically trouble the idea of truth. They cast doubt on the substantive character of truth as an idea, on the validity of claims made in the name of truth, and on the significance of truth in contemporary society. Moreover, these positions lend support to popular stances that many philosophers rightly have criticized, namely skepticism concerning whether truth can be known, relativism with respect to the validity of truth claims, and cynicism about whether truth is important. Such support for skepticism, relativism, and cynicism is a good reason to challenge deflationism, radical contextualism, and politicization, not by reviving a correspondence theory, however, but by proposing a new conception that shows truth to be a substantive and socially significant idea. Earlier, I said the standard concept of truth is in trouble because it was too narrow to begin with. There is more to truth than the purported correspondence between propositions and facts. And even this purported correspondence has been construed too narrowly. Hence, a first step toward addressing the current crisis in truth is to offer a more robust account of what I label propositional truth, the truth of propositions, beliefs, assertions, and the like. Propositional truth is what the standard concept is about. A second step will then be to argue 
that there is more to truth than such propositional truth. Let me now sketch these two steps in a preliminary fashion. And I go into much greater detail, of course, in my book, Social Domains of Truth. Section two, propositional truth. What then is propositional truth? Unlike many philosophers who tie propositional truth to the status of sentences or statements, I situate it in a field of practical interrelations, interrelations between human practices and the matters that lend themselves to our practices, matters that for convenience I label practical objects. Especially relevant in this field of practical interrelations are the speech acts whereby in communication with each other, we give descriptions and offer explanations. As a group, I call these speech acts assertions. Propositions are the abstract content of what we assert to each other when we make assertions. When, for example, I tell you today it is warm in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the proposition I have asserted is that today's weather in Grand Rapids is warm. What does it mean for such a proposition to be true? This is where a philosophical debate sets in between correspondence, coherence, minimalist, deflationist, and other sorts of truth theories. What all of these theories either ignore or underemphasize is how propositions arise within daily life practices and in interlinkage with practical objects. My own alternative is to say that practical objects offer themselves for our various practices, including the linguistic practices of reference and predication. When we make assertions, practical objects allow us to refer to them and to say something specific about them. For example, when I assert my dog Ruby is a faithful companion, I refer to a certain animal as my dog Ruby, and I specifically describe her as a faithful companion. In this instance, the phrase my dog Ruby serves as a referring expression, and the phrase is a faithful companion serves as a predicate expression. And the canine in question, who I could show on the screen because she's always by me, allows me to use these expressions to make this assertion about her. In this sense, practical objects like Ruby are predicatively available such that we can make assertions about them. When this predicative availability aligns with another relevant way in which objects offer themselves and our assertions pick out this alignment, then our assertions are correct. For my assertion about Ruby to be correct, what I say about her, that is, that she's a faithful companion, must line up in a contextually relevant way with how she behaves towards me, that is, with aspects of her non-predicative availability, such as her staying close to me throughout the day, no matter where I am. The alignment between predicative and non-predicative aspects of a practical object's availability, when we make assertions, is what I call the predicative self-disclosure of the object. Predicative self-disclosure is what the object to which we refer allows us to specify in relation to at least one non-predicative way in which that object is available to us. The correctness of assertions occurs in interlinkage with the predicative self-disclosure of practical objects. Moreover, the accuracy of propositions arises from such interlinkage. At a minimum, propositional truth encompasses both the correctness of assertions and the accuracy of propositions. Yet there is more to the truth of propositions than simple accuracy about the objects of our assertions. For propositions must also align properly with each other in patterns of inference. And that is where logic becomes important for the truth of propositions. In my longer discussions of this topic, I show that the truth of propositions cannot be reduced to either the accuracy of the insight or the logical validity of the inferences they involve. Rather, both accuracy and inferential validity are required 
and they are required in ways that interlink. The truth of propositions involves an interlinkage between accurate insight and inferential validity. Achieving such valid and accurate insight is not insignificant. Without it, our lives and social institutions would quickly run amok. Yet I submit that there is much more to truth than the truth of propositions. And we need to envision this more in order to understand why propositional truth itself is important. We need to envision what I call truth as a whole. Moreover, the interlinkage between accurate insight and inferential validity offers an important clue into what truth as a whole is like. It offers a clue because a dynamic correlation within propositional truth both echoes and participates in a dynamic correlation within truth as a whole. And let me explain. In order for inferential validity and accurate insight to interlink, those who make assertions must not only follow the rules of first order logic, but also do justice to what they make assertions about. In other words, their fidelity to the societal principle of logical validity must correlate with their doing justice to the object's predicative self-disclosure. Moreover, this correlation is dynamic for each side inflects the other. Our fidelity serves to promote the object's disclosure and our doing justice to the object's predicate of self-disclosure partly depends on how faithful we are to the principle of logical validity. Now I submit that this correlation within propositional truth both echoes and participates in the fidelity disclosure correlation that characterizes truth as a whole. Just as propositional truth requires a dynamic correlation between fidelity to logical validity and a propositional disclosure of the object, so in general, truth consists in a dynamic correlation between human fidelity to societal principles on the one hand and a life-giving disclosure of society on the other. Moreover, a version of this general correlation also shows up in every non-propositional sort of truth. And that is why among the various sorts of truth, propositional truth is not the primary sort. Indeed, there is no primary sort of truth. What is primary when it comes to truth is truth as a whole, not one of its types or kinds. Yet, propositional truth is important. Deliberate lying, bullshit, and misinformation undermine logical fidelity and accurate insight. They thereby damage not only the path of propositional truth, but also the pursuit of truth as a whole. For infidelity to one societal principle, logical validity in this case, both encourages and reinforces infidelity to other societal principles, such as solidarity and justice, even as the refusal to pursue accurate insight both fosters and strengthens other refusals to pursue what is societally good. So propositional truth is important, important both in its own right and for its role within truth as a whole. Yet propositional truth is not alone in having such double importance, and it is limited in ways that non-propositional sorts of truth are not. Although important then, propositional truth is not all important. The same goes for scientific truth, which takes propositional truth to a new level. Section three, truth as a whole. As a whole, I have already suggested, truth comes down to a dynamic correlation between two axes, between human fidelity to societal principles and a life-giving disclosure of society. Let me explain what fidelity and disclosure involve and how their correlation makes up the inner dynamic of truth as a whole. Then we will consider what such an account implies for the tasks of philosophy today. I begin with fidelity to societal principles. In speaking of societal principles, I refer to how throughout history, 
and within diverse cultural practices and social institutions, human beings have developed and responded to a limited plurality of expectations about what makes for goodness in social life. Among prominent societal principles in a contemporary setting, I would include those of solidarity and justice. Societal principles are central and shared expectations within the very fabric of our practices and institutions. At the same time, they provide overarching horizons of orientation for our lives as social beings. Moreover, societal principles take some of their content from how we respond to them, and that leaves them open to receiving new content in the future. So societal principles such as solidarity and justice are both historically rooted and open to the future. By mentioning solidarity and justice, I do not mean to suggest that societal principles hold only for economic and political matters. They also hold for aesthetic and logical matters, for example. The central expectation that expectations that play a special role in art and the academy, imaginative cogency in art and logical validity in science, those are societal principles. Like solidarity and justice, imaginative cogency and logical validity have arisen historically to become central and centrally contested expectations about what makes for goodness in life and society. The complex character of societal principles, both historical and futural, both shared and contested, both calling for human responses and arising from them, makes it hard to say what fidelity to societal principles comes to. Let me first say what fidelity does not mean. It does not mean either blind obedience or a mechanical reflex. Fidelity implies being persistently faithful to something or someone and taking responsibility for that to which we are faithful. Accordingly, fidelity to a societal principle such as justice means that we try to do what justice requires, even as we take responsibility for shaping this requirement by how we, re we respond to it. But there is more. Fidelity also implies an attachment, even an attraction to what receives our faithfulness. If we are faithful to societal principles, then we care about justice, about solidarity, about logical validity and the like, and we find it hard to dismiss, ignore, or blatantly subvert them. That does not imply that we readily agree about what these principles mean or easily do what they require, but it does suggest that what motivates our fidelity is more than a sense of obligation. It is a kind of love. Now, I submit that such fidelity is one axis of truth as a whole. It is an axis along which we try to be true to what truth requires. That is, we try to be faithful to what justice and solidarity and other societal principles ask of it, ask of us. Perhaps we can say such responses belong to the truing of social life, to its aligning with what makes for goodness in human life and society. The second axis within truth points to two other concepts I need to explicate, life-giving and disclosure. Let me begin with disclosure. In the current context, disclosure refers to an ongoing historical process. As a historical process, it unfolds in one direction or another. And that means truth as a whole also is not simply a structure or a state of being. Instead, it is a directional process. Perhaps we can say truth has a certain structure. It has two axes, for example, yet it is more than a structure. Truth as a whole is a directional and structured process. The disclosure in question pertains to society as a whole. It pertains to whether and how society opens up rather than closes down. Here, opening up means in part that society develops in a direction that minimally allows and maximally encourages 
human fidelity to societal principles. A disclosure of today's society, for example, would occur when social conditions become more conducive to the pursuit of justice. Yet this process in society is not simply an opening up in the direction of greater fidelity. It is a life-giving process. The disclosure of society is life-giving when it allows human beings and other creatures to flourish in their connections. A society whose trajectory encourages human beings to dominate so-called nature and exploit it for their own purposes would lack life-giving disclosure as would a society in which over the generations, the rich and powerful regularly oppress the poor and marginalized. Life-giving indicates both a call to human beings to care for the earth and one another, and the potential they have heeding this call to foster the interconnected flourishing of all creatures. Often, of course, we struggle to envision which changes in society today would contribute to life-giving disclosure. Nevertheless, we experience the pull of a possibly better future, and we can ask whether society is headed in that direction. This question can serve to orient attempts to bring about social change. Like fidelity to societal principles, the process of life-giving disclosure is both historically rooted and future-oriented. Having considered the two axes within truth, we can ask how they intersect. I describe their intersection as a dynamic correlation. By correlation, I mean they are mutually interdependent. We cannot have one axis without the other. Fidelity to societal principles would lose its point if society could not move in the direction of interconnected flourishing. And society could not undergo life-giving disclosure if no one pursued fidelity to societal principles. To describe this correlation in positive terms, we can say that the telos of human fidelity to societal principles is to promote a process in which human beings and other creatures come to flourish in their interconnections. Conversely, a life-giving disclosure of society depends in part on the degree to which cultural practices and social institutions come to align with societal principles such as solidarity and justice. To flourish in their interconnections with other creatures, human beings must contribute to that process via their fidelity to societal principles. Both axes in this correlation are historical and both are open to a future that is still to come. That makes the correlation dynamic in more ways than one. In the first place, the meaning of fidelity and disclosure is always being worked out as history unfolds. Hence, we can't, cannot say once and for all what either fidelity or disclosure comes to. Yet this does not mean that we cannot say something definite about what they actually come to. In the second place, the correlation is dynamic because there is more to each access than how it correlates with the other. On the one hand, human fidelity to societal principles does not suffice to bring about interconnected flourishing. There is more to the historical process of disclosure than what human beings contribute. And we do not always foresee or control the consequences of our attempts at fidelity. On the other hand, there is more to fidelity to societal principles than what it contributes to interconnected flourishing. When it is genuine, such fidelity is motivated by care, care for the principles themselves, not only by concern for interconnected flourishing. And we hear in them a call to responsibility that comes from beyond ourselves. Truth in its most comprehensive sense then is not the same as either fidelity or disclosure as either our being true to societal principles or society truly opening up, rather, Truth is the historically rooted and future-oriented correlation between human fidelity and societal disclosure. The challenge for such a comprehensive, normative, and future-oriented conception 
is to show how it helps us make sense of different sorts of truth, both propositional and non-propositional. My leading hypothesis in this regard is that different sorts of truth occur in distinct social domains, such as science, politics, art, and religion. In each social domain, truth displays a specific correlation between fidelity and disclosure. And each specific correlation both echoes the dynamic correlation between fidelity and disclosure in truth as a whole and participates in that holistic dynamic correlation. Each specific type of truth differs from the others, however, in how the whole comes to expression, specifically in the societal principle that has primacy for a certain range of practices and in the sort of disclosure that correlates with fidelity to this societal principle. Yet truth as a whole is not merely the composite of these types, rather it is the dynamic that pervades them all. Every type of truth manifests and echoes the entire process whereby human fidelity to societal principles correlates with a life-giving disclosure of society. In other words, the pluralism of truth is holistic, just as the holism of truth is pluralistic. According to this conception, which I call holistic alethic pluralism, not all truth is propositional. Nevertheless, propositional truth displays the sort of dynamic correlation between fidelity and disclosure that characterizes all truth. Section four, last section, philosophy, social critique, and practical wisdom. Now let's consider what holistic alethic pluralism implies for the contemporary tasks of philosophy. Professional philosophy in the West today specializes in specialization. Like most other academic disciplines, it has become a house of many niches with neither roof nor windows. Specialists gather in each niche. Sometimes we bump into specialists from other niches, but we have little sense of a shared philosophical vocation and meaningful conversations with the wider public rarely occur. Truth theory has become one such niche. If that description of contemporary philosophy is roughly right, then to propose a holistic and internally differentiated idea of truth, as I have, is to call for a drastic reconstruction in philosophy, to borrow a century old phrase from John Dewey. For to the extent that a passionate search for truth remains central to philosophy, we philosophers cannot rest secure in our little niches, doing our professional things, while, while the world around us goes up in flames. Truth requires us to reconnect the disaggregated parts of our discipline, address central issues that arise in other academic fields and social domains, and undertake two-way conversations with a non-academic public about life and society. We no longer have the luxury, and really we never did, to act as if truth does not matter or to doubt that it does. Rather, we need to show beyond the confines of specialized truth theory, what truth is and why it matters, not just in philosophy, but in society as a whole. And this suggests that philosophy has two interlinked tasks in society today, namely to engage in comprehensive social critique and to help foster practical wisdom. I begin with social critique. As comprehensive social critique, the philosophical search for truth in, includes three foci. First, to find alethic guidelines and openings. Second, to expose barriers to the unfolding of truth. And third, to envisage a future. Let me briefly discuss each in turn. First, philosophy needs to ask what 
fidelity, disclosure, and their correlation come to in contemporary society. That means philosophy needs to be transdisciplinary. In collaboration with other academic fields and social domains, it must try to identify the leading societal principles in contemporary society and establish what, under current social conditions, the life-giving disclosure of society would be like. Unlike many other critical theorists who regard philosophy as a type of social critique, I emphasize finding traces of truth rather than simply exposing signs of falsehood. Further, I consider these to be more than mere traces. Although contested and often rejected or ignored, societal principles such as solidarity and justice are deeply embedded in the fabric of contemporary society just as the desire for interconnected flourishing is widespread, even when it takes distorted forms. Nevertheless, I also believe philosophers should be careful about defining such societal principles. This is an inherently transdisciplinary project and societal principles emerge historically from social struggles. Although philosophers who identify a societal principle aim to point out a widely shared expectation, they do not necessarily speak for everyone in the struggle, nor do they speak in a language everyone shares. Something similar holds for trying to establish what the life-giving disclosure of society comes to. To spell out what truth comes to then, philosophers must carefully identify the societal principles and types of disclosure whose correlation constitutes truth in specific social domains, always attentive to the diverse voices that ask to be heard and never equating truth in one domain with truth as a whole. And where conflicts emerge between different social domains of truth, such as science and politics, philosophers should uncover the pressures that generate such conflicts. Society as currently constituted erects many roadblocks to the fidelity and disclosure that truth requires. Hence, in the second place, transdisciplinary philosophy also needs to expose barriers to the unfolding of truth, both in specific social domains and with respect to truth as a whole. These barriers take three forms, normative deficiencies, structural distortions, and directional dead ends. Consider first the issue of normative deficiencies. This pertains primarily to how a society undermines or twists the meaning of societal principles. Measured by the societal principle of resourcefulness or stewardship, for example, global capitalism is a normatively deficient economic system. Rather than carefully stewarding the Earth's potentials for interconnected flourishing, the capitalist economy exploits these potentials for the sake of private profit. It turns fidelity, fidelity to the societal principle of resourcefulness into the pursuit of wealth and consumption for their own sakes, usually at the expense of needy countries and vulnerable habitats. So, its responses to the call to take care of the Earth's potentials obscure or subvert what resourcefulness comes to. The challenge such economic falsehood poses is to call for significant normative reorientation. Normative deficiencies are both induced and reinforced by structural distortions. Structural distortions occur when one social domain of truth thrives at the expense of others. This usually happens when power becomes concentrated in certain social institutions. In my book, Social Domains of Truth, for example, I discuss how systemic economic and political pressures impinge on universities and threaten the pursuit of scientific truth. These pressures stem from the inordinate power, the hegemony of the capitalist economy and the administrative state. At the same time, systemic pressures would not be such a threat if universities did not internalize them. And that means universities can also resist them in various ways. 
To resist these systemic pressures, however, would call attention to a cascading series of structural distortions. The privileging of hard sciences over other social domains of truth. The failure of universities to become generative centers for public dialogue and debate. The tilting of university governance and operations away from faculty deliberations, and so on. One cannot address the normative deficiencies of contemporary universities without taking such structural distortions into account. To challenge falsehood in society requires the removal of structural distortions. The third kind of barrier to the unfolding of truth is what I call directional dead ends. These are the most difficult barriers not only to describe but also to remove. Discussions of falsehood at this level are extremely fraught. As a critique of the direction in which society is headed, exposing directional dead ends presupposes a view of what makes for goodness in social life. Appealing to such a view, one can zero in on tendencies that point society away from societal goodness. When such tendencies become thoroughly embedded in the fabric of a society, I do not hesitate to apply the label societal evil. By this term, I mean life-destroying tendencies so deeply entrenched in society that they are difficult to re recognize, hard to take responsibility for, and tricky to resist. They also are not easy to challenge in philosophy. Partial or piecemeal criticisms do not suffice. One needs to question the direction of society as a whole. But this also means that transdisciplinary philosophy needs to envision how society as a whole could be true. How would truth unfold if the truth already in society were unblocked? I realize that such social critical envisaging of a future has a speculative character many philosophers find offensive. Who in their right mind can claim to know what a wholly true society would be like? What prevents philosophical speculation along these lines from shading off into the worst sort of utopian ideology? These are legitimate questions. To address them, let me explain what I have in mind. Truth as a whole, I have said, continually unfolds. It is intrinsically historical, and it is open to a future no one fully comprehends. At the same time, however, how truth unfolds now and how it has unfolded in the past create possibilities for its unfolding in the future. These are not simply logical possibilities. They are historical possibilities. Given the requisite changes in contemporary practices and institutions, this unfolding could actually occur. A comprehensive social critique will ask what historical possibilities society holds for the unfolding of truth as a whole. In my own work, this future, futural orientation toward historical possibilities has led me to envisage a differential transformation of contemporary society. By this, I mean a process of significant change in society as a whole that occurs within diverse interpersonal relations, cultural practices, and social institutions, across the interfaces among economic, political, and civil societal macrostructures, and with respect to distinct societal principles especially resourcefulness, justice, and solidarity. The changes needed involve both normative reorientation and structural transformation, and they must occur in many diverse sites and move in mutually reinforcing directions. I have also tried to show that such changes are historically possible. Far from being utopian in a questionable way, an idea like differential transformation can help people envision a historically achievable society in which humans and other creatures can more fully flourish. It can also help them reimagine their own part in achieving such a society. This is the legitimate 
an indispensable role of social critical speculation in philosophy. It is also where comprehensive social critique intersects the pursuit of practical wisdom. Philosophy, countless philosophers have said, is the love of wisdom. It is out of such love that philosophers seek the truth. But what sort of wisdom does the philosopher love? And how does the philosophical search for truth link up with the love of wisdom? To address these questions, let me say something about the role of philosophy in what I call social ethics. I use the term social ethics to refer to reflection upon the ways in which following societal principles such as solidarity and justice, human beings in their relations, practices, and institutions can contribute to the interconnected flourishing of all creatures to the common good. At this point, truth theory spills over into social ethics, just as reflection on social goodness flows into a conception of truth. Indeed, truth and goodness intersect, and we can understand practical wisdom as the social ethical insights gained from living the truth. Philosophy as social critique both learns from the pursuit of social ethical wisdom and contributes to it. Philosophical social critique learns from this pursuit because the meaning of societal principles unfolds in lived attempts to be faithful to them, just as the scope of life-giving disclosure emerges from organized efforts to foster interconnected flourishing. At the same time, however, philosophy as social critique contributes to the pursuit of practical wisdom in three ways. First, by helping people seek and embrace the good within social life. Second, by encouraging them to resist societal evil. And third, by articulating reasons to live in hope. Let me briefly comment on each way. First, to spell out what truth comes to, social critical philosophers must identify societal principles and types of disclosure and their correlation in specific social domains. Such philosophical articulation of do domain-specific truth can support people's pursuit of the good within social life. It can help them be faithful to a domain's primary societal principle without losing sight of other relevant principles. It can also point them toward the ways in which domain-specific practices and organizations foster life-giving disclosure. Second, social critical philosophy can also encourage people to resist that which blocks or twists a good. Here, I am especially concerned with what I have called societal evil. Societal evil occurs even though no one person or group or organization seems responsible for it. Yet, it occurs within cultural practice and social, and social institutions for which everyone in a society is responsible. For societal evil has to do with the direction in which society is, as a whole is headed and with how a nexus of interlinked practices and institutions sets this direction. In reflecting on the direction of society, philosophy as social critique seeks to specify wherein societal evil lies and to suggest resources for resistance. This can encourage the pursuit of wisdom it can help people understand and care about destructive societal tendencies beyond their personal control that directly affect their social lives. Tendencies like climate change, large scale poverty, and growing hostility towards so called aliens. Such philosophical critique can also help people acknowledge their own involvement in societal, in societal evil without misassigning responsibility for it. And that in turn encourages people to resist societal evil in the spirit of truth. Third, to resist evil in the spirit of truth, people need to have future-oriented hope. They must have hope 
that the relations, practices, and institutions in which they participate can more fully align with relevant societal principles and more fully contribute to interconnected flourishing. They need to expect that attempts to live the truth are not in vain, despite the pervasiveness and power of societal evil. And they need to have some sense that contemporary societal evil is not an inevitable fate, that the tendencies and forces currently destroying social life not only can be resisted, but also in the long run can be transformed. By itself, philosophy cannot provide such future-oriented hope, nor should it try. Yet, because of its futural orientation towards historical possibilities, social critical philosophy can help articulate reasons why such hope is not misplaced. It can indicate how past attempts to follow and formulate societal principles have enhanced social life, despite societal obstacles, and have helped remove the obstacles. Social critical philosophy can also help people understand how their participation in social institutions can contribute to change for the better and not simply reinforce destructive patterns. And it can help people envision a society-wide transformation to which within their communities and organizations, they can contribute. Philosophy cannot remove social indifference or despair. In the ways just mentioned, however, it can help people find reasons for social hope. If philosophy derives such reasons from a sufficiently capacious and truth-oriented social critique, then these will not be reasons for false hope. And philosophy itself, in its pursuit of truth, will give expression to a hopeful love of wisdom. And that is my vision of philosophy for a world in crisis. Thank you very much.